Welcome, welcome to this uh, event, uh, one of our final events, I think, for this semester at the Center for American Studies and Research at uh, the American University in Cairo. Uh, hello, my name is Mark Dietz. I'm the director uh, of the center and an assistant professor of African and world history in the history department. Um, but um, we're here um, with uh, this event coming uh, from the, the School of uh, Global Affairs and, and Public Policy. Um, and we're uh, honored to have uh, Dean Noha Makawi with us here today to, to help uh, lead this. And um, we also have uh, an associate dean from the School of Huss, uh, Jillian Campana, who's actually one of the panelists. So um, I like to say that I kind of straddle both worlds between the School of Huss. Um, and so uh, just a quick, uh, some of you have probably heard this before, but just kind of a quick reminder, um, CASAR, or, or in other words, the Center for American Studies and Research, was created in 2003 uh, by the Saudi prince uh, al-Walid, um, who wanted to foster cultural understanding between the Middle East uh, and America, the United States of America uh, in particular. Um, so in addition to these kinds of outreach activities, we also have a number of uh, other kinds of uh, activities that we're involved in. One of those is a minor. We actually have a minor in American studies. So, um, you know, I've heard a few people say that, uh, well, why would I study American studies um, in Cairo and I, when I could just go to uh, America? To well, not everybody can go to America, for one thing. Um, and for another thing, I also think that it's, um, you know, that we, we bring a, a certain viewpoint in constantly talking about um, the, the, the relations between uh, the United States um, and, and the MENA region. So anyway, I've got a lot more to say about that, as you can probably tell. <laughs> so, uh, please, <laughs> so please uh, come talk to me sometime if you, have, if you have more questions. But if you have questions about the minor especially, please go onto our website. Uh, to take a look, you have to take, uh, some of you may have already taken a course and you're not even aware of it, um, but uh, we have a list of courses there that are a part of our minor, and if you've taken one course already, uh, another four courses and you've got that minor. Uh, okay. Um, by the way, so uh, I'm very quickly going to turn this over to uh, my very able assistant, uh, Yasmin, who is uh, wonderful. She just, she makes uh, CASAR work. Uh, she keeps everything uh, uh, moving and, and flowing, and I really appreciate her uh, level of commitment and professionalism. And uh, of course, um, I'm going to let her introduce uh, our, our guest panelists, um, Hoda Sada and Jillian Campana. It's a real honor to, to have both of them as a part of this. But first, I want to t turn it over um, to uh, the Dean of the School of GAP uh, and um, my boss and somebody I've really come to, uh, I know she doesn't like it when I use that term, but it's, it's true. And, um, but she, um, somebody I've really come to respect a great deal, Noha El Makawi. So nice to see you all here. Um, you have a very special treat. Um, being in this room with those two power women and having the chance to listen to their reflections is a real treat. So consider this our Christmas gift for you. <laughs> Thank you, Yasmin, for making it happen. Um, you all know that uh, we have been very preoccupied lately on campus and worldwide with a very big, big, big crisis. Um, it's beyond a crisis, it's a catastrophe. In Palestine. And notice I'm not saying Gaza, I'm saying Palestine. Because it's beyond Gaza, bigger than Gaza. It's a catastrophe. And very many of us were wondering as we were walking down this beautiful campus, thinking about this catastrophe. Wow, we are here on an American campus, and we are watching the United States take some difficult positions that some of us may agree with, others may not. 
And what are we doing here today? Why this? I'm not asking you to shift your minds completely to something else. Because everything is connected, isn't it, in this world? But I think this is particularly precious as a topic for today, even in light of what all of us are walking around with, this very heavy emotional baggage that all of us are walking around campus with. Because in everything that the American Studies Center at the School of Gap uh, here in, at AUC, we are trying to figure out where are the bridges to be built between different cultures. One bridge is probably very much damaged from the catastrophe unfolding in the region, but maybe there are other bridges that we should be continuing to build. And this topic is one of those bridges that two of the most brilliant minds will help us understand better today. I will say one final point before I leave you for what you came here for, which is to listen to both of them. And that is gender issues are becoming very controversial issues in building bridges across the world today. Even for someone like myself, I come from the development industry. When we sit together as development agencies, including donors who give money for good causes, I kid you not, the issue of gender always comes up as a controversial issue of misunderstanding between development agencies. What are we doing for the empowerment of women? How far are we going? Are we pushing too much? Are we being pushed too much? Where is the genuine accomplishments that each culture has done for itself, with or without pushing from the outside? What is the journey that those two cultures have had? And can we build a bridge? This is for me what makes today's conversation not alien, not tangential, but very much important because the world is losing one bridge after another. And those two bridge builders today with very accomplished backgrounds will help us reflect on this issue further. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Dean Noha and Dr. Lees, for your very kind word introductions. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We will commence this panel discussion by playing two concise videos, first for both Egypt and the US briefly, exhibiting the timeline of the very question we're asking this panel discussion today. And then I'll introduce our wonderful guest speakers for today and invite them to the panel. All right, we'll start with the uh, Egypt video.
move to the video on uh, accomplishments in the U.S. Now that we've seen a glimpse, a brief glimpse of the struggles and accomplishments women have witnessed across history in both countries, it's time to dig deeper into the question of our discussion today for today's panel with our very special guest speakers, Dr. Ruta Sadda and Dr. Jillian Campana. Let me kindly introduce our speakers to the audience for giving them the floor for their own presentations. All right, let me begin with Dr. Ruta Sadda representing Egypt in today's discussion. Dr. Ruta is a feminist activist, a professor of English comparative literature at Cairo University. She is also the co-founder of Women in Memory Forum, which I strongly encourage you to visit um, online. Uh, her research uh, interests are in the areas of gender studies, comparative literature, and oral history. Dr. Hoda is the author of Gender, Nation, and the Arabic Novel, Egypt, 1892-2008. She's also the co-editor of or Oral History in Times of Change, Gender, Documentation, and the Making of Archives. Last but not least, the School of Gap is highly honored to have Dr. Hoda serve as a member on its advisory council. Welcome, Dr. Hoda. We are equally honored to have our very young Dr. Jillian Campana presenting the U.S. in today's discussion. Dr. Campana is a professor and associate dean for the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at AUC. Her research and creative work look at the drama as a tool to build community, quality, and identity. She has developed numerous pro specialized programs across the world, including ongoing programs in Sweden, India, Hong Kong, the U.S., and Philippines for persons living with brain injuries and for victims of sexual trafficking. She's the author of numerous articles, book chapters, and plays, as well as three books. Her newest book, It's Not My Fault, Five New Plays on Sexual Harassment in Egypt, is co-authored with Dina Amin and AG students and alumni. It's available now in both English and Arabic. You may purchase the book online or at the AUC bookstore right here on campus. Welcome, Dr. Campana. I invite you, please, to come to the panel. Thank you. Before we begin, I kindly ask you to uh, silence your phones, please, and I'll give the floor to Dr. Hoda first and then Dr. Jillian. Thank you. Okay. All right, so hello, everyone. Really an honor to be here. Thank you very much, Yasmin, Mark, Noha, um, for inviting me. And, um, and I'll just, um, you know, just get into it. And uh, Dean Makewi just mm -hmm. talked about the journey. And I think 
it just so happens that I decided to talk about the journey that, um, that we, can, we had in Egypt towards uh, more rights, women's rights. And of course, just to begin with, the, um, with this question that was posed to us, how far women have come in the past 120 years in Egypt? And I mean, the short answer is we've come a very long way, which is, I mean, again, and thank you, Yasmin, for putting together this very, very informative uh, video, really very good. Um, but then, of course, but we haven't come far enough, or not as far as we could have. And that's really what I would like to pick up. And this is not in any way uh, meant to be a negative assessment of what has been achieved. In fact, I argue, and I still argue, that the feminist movement in Egypt is one of the most successful social movements in the country, if not the most successful. It's, it's a fact. Um, so, and like all social movements, uh, telling the story of what has been achieved, what remains to be achieved, is really a narrative of struggle, of compromises, of negotiations, and of losses and gains. So in this very brief intervention, I'll try and construct this narrative that foregrounds key historical moments which promoted or impeded the activism of feminists to achieve gender justice. Now, this contextual background, broadly speaking, again, I'm, being, I'm generalizing here, so we need to begin with colonial presence, anti-colonial nationalist response, the establishment of the modern post-colonial nation state in 1952, characterized by authoritarian rule, open door policies adopted by Sadat in 1970s, which actually changed the course of Egypt towards economic liberalization, as well as relative political liberalization. And then the shift and how this shift in policies coincided with a global internationalization of women's rights and the significant growth of the role of the UN and international bodies in furthering women's rights agendas. And I apologize for my voice. I don't know what to do about it, but it's an allergy, so. <clears throat> now, it is important to take note of the fact that the Egyptian, Egyptian feminists in general advocated for their rights against the background of of these very, very um, you know, important uh, variables, colonialism, authoritarianism, global transformations, and sometimes promoting, sometimes curtailing the struggle for rights. So the beginnings. I always like to begin with the 19th, I mean, the beginnings are at the end of the 19th century, when bettering the position of women or women's liberation was linked with national liberation and the modernization project. Egypt was then a British protectorate, and the so-called backward status of women in Egypt and the Arab world was used to justify the continuation of British rule, or in the words of Rosemary Sayer, the Palestinian historian, it was used as a stick to beat Arab societies. So on the one hand, we have colonial representatives, for example, Lord Cromer, seemingly championing the cause of women in Egypt, while at the same time, we found out, he campaigned against women's suffrage in his own country. So, double standards, basically. On the other hand, we have early reformers, such as Qasim Amin, who accepted the colonial premise that the backward status of women was an obstacle to the progress of the country, and argued that the liberation of the country is linked to the liberation of women. Amin also called for bettering the position of women as a condition for the establishment of a new modern nation. So here we have Lord Cromer's interventions resulted in a perception that women's rights agendas were westernized, a colonial plot to destroy the Arab family, and while Amin rendered the woman question a national cause, which is a good thing, making it a national priority, this argument inadvertently resulted in women becoming a symbol of the degree of the modernization of the country, and at the same time, symbols of cultural identity and so many things. Now, between the colonial and the nationalist manipulation of women's issues, Women were symbols of political positions. And I like to stress this because the feminist struggle for political social rights, for equality be before the law, always became diverted to discussion of something else. So we talk about the importance of changing personal status laws and then the discussion shifts to another topic, I, as far as, I mean, another topic really. And so, I mean, in a way, I think, Acquiring the status of a symbol can be a very dangerous thing. Now, um, so move, moving forward to 1919, which is an important moment in the history of Egypt, 
Now, the revolution of 1919 against British occupation, in which women participated in the independence movement, accorded value and legitimacy to women's demands for rights. Now, the period from the 1920s to the early 50s is generally acknowledged as one of the most vibrant in the history of the women's movement in Egypt. The Egyptian Feminist Union, which is, was founded in 1923 by, uh, by Hoda Sha'arawi and, uh, and colleagues, the union played an important role in raising awareness, lobbying for the advancement of women's rights agenda, mobilizing resources and public opinion to advocate for national independence. Members of the union assumed radical positions on many issues, on national independence, on democracy and Arab solidarity. And then we come to the revolution of the three officers in 1952, which ushered a new era for women. In 1956, the constitution, uh, the, the constitution that was um, issued in 1956 con uh, guaranteed equality before the law and no discrimination based on gender, race, language, religion, or belief, and granted, most importantly, women political rights. Labor laws were modified to enable working women to perform their reproductive roles. These are all very positive developments. However, women's demands at the time to change and modify the personal status laws to ensure equality in the domestic sphere was ignored and patriarchal domination of women in the private sphere was left unchallenged. Now this created a bizarre situation, which continues until this minute, I have to say, where women attained equality in the public sphere, but were subject to the authority of male members of their families in the private sphere. So rights in the public sphere, no rights in the private sphere. And this remains a key impediment to gender justice. Now, what does it mean in practical terms? I'll just give you a couple of what I think are bizarre examples. But so women can be ministers, can be CEOs, can be directors of banks, professors. But this same professor, this same minister or director of a bank will not be able to manage her children's uh, finances, uh, regardless of her age, for example, or her position. And this woman minister will not be allowed to transfer her children from one school to another, uh, despite being a minister. She could be a minister of education anyway. So, right, so again, rights in the public sphere, no rights in the private sphere. And this remains to be this huge anomaly, paradox, call it what you want. Now, 1950s also saw the rise of what is known in the literature as state feminism. It's a concept which has different implications in different con contexts. But in the case of Egypt, it generally meant that state institutions monopolized the right to speak on behalf of women. So in effect, the newly founded postmodern state demobilized the Egyptian women's movement. At the so again, the, ex the good example for this is that at the same instance, 1956, that women obtained suffrage in the constitution, the Egyptian Feminist Union was dissolved by orders of the Revolutionary Council leadership and replaced by the Association of Hoda Sharawi, which is a charity organization that provided social services. Um, so it was no longer allowed to pursue a political agenda or to practice activities of any political nature. Now, this new state of affairs resulted in the expulsion of many feminists from public life. Some were able to withdraw quietly and refocus their attention to a political public service. Others paid a high price for their independence. I mean, and then of course, in the presentation, the example of Doria Shafi, prominent feminist at the forefront of, <coughs> of advocacy for uh, political participation, extremely well known, extremely active in the 1940s and the 1950s. She paid a heavy price for publicly objecting to the dictatorial nature of the new political order. She was placed under house arrest. Her name was banned from newspapers. Her organization was dissolved. And she eventually died in 1975. Actually, she committed suicide. Now, fast forward to 1980s. Now, the next important moment in the development of women, the women's movement in Egypt began at the end of the 1970s, early 1980s, turn of the... And with Sadat's open door policy and the shift to economic and political liberalization, relative political liberalization, of course, the 1980s saw the emergence of a new generation of women rights groups 
who benefited from the partial opening of political spaces for civil society activism. Now, this development coincided with the phenomenon known as the internationalization of women's rights that gained momentum in the 1980s and the 1990s. What is this internationalization of women's rights? In 1975, 1975 um, uh, the UN declared the International Women's Year. The first World Conference of Women in Mexico City was held in the same year, and 1976 until 1985 was announced as the UN Decade for Women. 1979, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women was adopted and endorsed by most countries. Not the US, I think. <laughs> anyway, uh, The Second World Conference on Women, held in Nairobi in 1985, was described by many as the birth of global feminism. Um, at, and as it situated women's rights agendas at the center of world politics. And then comes the Beijing Platform for Action, adopted in 1995. It declared women's rights as human rights, but more importantly, and this is really the issue, it committed states to specific actions to guarantee their compliance with the agreed resolutions. Now, there is a vast amount of scholarship assessing the impact of the role of the UN and the internationalization of women's rights on women's movements all over the world. It has been argued that the integration of feminism in the international discourse of human rights with the emphasis on the responsibilities of states to protect those rights as a prerequisite for inclusion in the international regime of civilized states led to positive measures undertaken by states in support of women's rights. So basically, women's issues became part of political uh, international politics. And feminist researchers also shed light on how participation in these high-profile UN conferences helped them legitimize their demands, mobilize resources, and strengthen local women's movements. So there's, been, um, there's obviously been also a critique of these um, of trends. Now, it is noteworthy that Egypt and Tunisia were amongst the countries that proposed the UN, that, that the UN dedicate a year to the discussion of women's rights agendas in the international arena. <clears throat> now, this opportunity was seized by women rights activists who, con who participated in international conferences, joined international networks, consolidated transnational alliances, and international forums and meetings also became platforms for lobbying governments in the Arab world and Globally, actually. And I'd like, I always like to quote this. Um, it's something, it's, um, uh, there's this very important article by Mona Al-Ghobeshi who looked at the processes of political change in Egypt. And she argued that the internationalization of the political regime in Egypt since the mid-1990s was a key factor that afforded, I'm quoting, activists and ordinary citizens unexpected political, political leverage in their asymmetric share of public power with the executive. And she pointed out that despite the absence of democratic governance, the Egyptian state was a signatory to a human rights convention and treaties and so on. And these, all, all of these things imposed international legal commitments. And this helped activists' uh, advocacy and demand for rights. Now, the platforms made available to femi feminists by the internationalization of women's rights had a positive consequence on enabling feminist transnationalism, where non-state actors, women rights groups, independent feminists were able to work together across borders. And this is really important. These transnational encounters have not been without challenges and problems due to unequal power relations, of course, colonial legacies, regional and international disputes and rivalries. Nonetheless, it is possible to say that there are strong feminist networks and alliances in existence today that have succeeded in addressing and managing some of these older challenges. We come to 2011. Now, the next important moment in the history of feminist activism in Egypt is the 25th of January revolution in 2011. The revolution opened political spaces for mobilization and activism on the ground. Feminists seized the opportunities that were presented they formed feminist coalitions, partnered with broader coalitions, joined new political parties and various initiatives, organized campaigns, participated in negotiations with official bodies, 
and state actors over legal reform, lobbied members of parliament. It was, there were, there were two or three years of very, very uh, active, um, very, very interesting activism. Now there's consensus amongst feminists in Egypt that one of the revolutionary gains has been the breaking of the taboo about sexual violence. A law was passed criminalizing harassment, anti-sexual harassment units have been established in police stations, and the issue is no longer a taboo. This has been a gain, and it, it continues. So where are we now? I'm concluding. Now in the aftermath of the wave of revolutions that swept the Arab world in 2011, revolutions that actually inspired the world, from the Occupy movement in the US to the Spanish indignados, protests in Taksim Gezi Park, Brazilian Spring, and so many other examples. So there is definitely a backlash, a regressive current that aims to curtail people's power and chip away at the value and the ideals of human rights, women's rights, respect of human dignity, equality for all, and not just for a chosen few. Now this is manifested in the rise in popularity of right-wing parties, right-wing pundits, who unashamedly incite fear-mongering against minorities, against refugees, and against women's rights. Now, feminists all over the world are concerned, I mean, these are discussions that are happening all the time, about losing the gains achieved so far in the area of rights. In academia, for example, women and gender studies programs have been canceled or deprived of resources, and this is an ongoing story. In 2022, of course, there's the famous US Supreme Court that overturned the Roe versus Wade ruling in 1973 that guaranteed a constitutional right to abortion in the US. Now, examples of the backlash are abundant. And going back to our, I mean, region, we have, we, we have to talk about the wars, the conflicts, the political instability. These are all um, factors that do not bode well for women, for women's rights, for anybody, of course. So, yes, it's, um, where we are now is, is perhaps in a difficult spot. Yes, we have come a long way, but life is a constant struggle, and I guess the road to justice requires our vigilance, our perseverance, and determination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. It was very informative. Thank you so much. Uh, we turn now, the floor goes to Dr. Jillian. Yeah, can I just ask oh, sure. Jillian? Yeah, sure. Also, um, <coughs> I want to pick up on, um, just so I move away from being behind this. I want to pick up on a couple things. I mean, the first, the first thing that I want to mention is in Dr. Noha's um, introduction when she was talking about, you know, the, the moment of catas catastrophe and crisis that we're at um, and, and the connections between this talk in Palestine. And I've thought a lot about that. I gave a talk last week as well about sexual harassment. And, and it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing to be talking about but we're also, when we talk about women's rights, we also have to think about intersectionality and the way that um, I experience oppression is different than the way that Yasmin experiences oppression is different than the way Dr. Mark experiences oppression. And at the same time, there can be many oppressive elements throughout the world, um, some more pressing than others, but nonetheless, they have circles around each other and they coexist and they exist at the same time. Um, so just thinking about that. And then also just listening to Dr. Huda talk and, and I thought, wow, you know, when you talked about the 1919 revolution and, and how that was maybe kind of a springboard for a, um, some, some empowerment in the sphere of women's rights. And then I thought, wow, it's so interesting in the US in, in 1777, women who were married lost the right to own property. And if you think about that, you know, that's like, uh, you know, when the U.S. became a, a, its own country, 1776, the year before. So then we have this, this country which at times can seem like, a, I guess, a world leader, I guess, 
maybe not now as much as it used to, but going kind of the opposite way, which is really interesting that Egypt took this as a moment to spring forward, whereas the U.S. took this as a moment to spring backward. And then we look at Roe v. Wade as well. So, you know, for every, it's, it's a very cheesy saying, but for every time any group of people reaches forward, then something usually happens as well, and it's incumbent upon us to recognize those moments and to have them be moments of interception where we can say, okay, I'm drawing the line right here. We're, gonna move. we're, not, gonna, we're not gonna go back any further. We're just gonna go forward. I often wonder why we don't have equality yet. And, and I think maybe we're taking too many steps back and we need to draw the line a little bit more. Um, let's go to the, ah, it's me. So I thought I would start, where do I point this? Okay, so I thought I'd start by just having us think about equality in general. I know I'm supposed to talk about the US, but I think the bigger thing is this question of equality. What is equality? So when, when I think about it, in the US I think about the things that have kind of affected me personally. That's how I understand it. That's how most of us understand large problems. They, they trickle down to like, okay, how has that affected me in my own life? So same access to jobs, same job offers. Those are two very different things. Same pay for the same job, which I know both countries have passed laws, but is it really? I don't know. This is, I'm not convinced. I don't have data that convinces me that still the same pay for the same job is happening. Equal representation in leadership positions, it's, that's a tough one. I mean, we still have a, quite a ways to go in this area, even though we've made significant gains. And it, when we skip to the bottom, access to education, I mean, this is the one area of all these where we can say, and you can look around AUC and go, there are more women, there are more females at AUC campus than there are males. I can't remember what the breakdown in terms of student body is. But it's not 50-50, I wanna say it's like 58 to 40, I, I'm not sure, but it's, it's more women. I wonder why. If, if, think about maybe why this is, of all these areas, this is the one where women in, and you're at an American institution, so we can look at that. Why is this the one thing that we can say, yes, we have qualitative data that says this? I have my own theories. And, and if we go to the next slide, oops, I keep saying we, me. There we go. This is me, this is my family, this is me and my mom. My mom was of that generation where you maybe worked, but you didn't have to. And in fact, if you were lucky, you didn't. And my mother instilled in me a lot of ideas about what I should be able to do that she couldn't do. She didn't go to college. She did get a job when she absolutely had to, when my father left the family and she needed to make a living. Um, and she got a job at a school. And so to go back to the education, in her generation, and certainly in her parents' generation, in the United States, a girl had a couple options. You could be a teacher, you could be a nurse, or you could be a secretary, or you could be a flight attendant. That's the cool one. But that was also, there's some connotations there way back when. So my mother went to a school. And a lot of people went to schools. A lot of women became teachers. And so education has been a sphere that women have felt comfortable in and recognized that they were a valued member of the community. And so I wonder if there's a connection between more women now. Worldwide, there are more women in undergraduate programs than there are men. So this is like, how is that going to change things? Um, I moved to Egypt when I was 23 years old. And I'm, I, I left again, and I'm back for eight years now, but I moved because I was working in Los Angeles as an actor, and I had a series of very strange things that happened to me that are very, very typical. I um, was told so many times 
that I needed to lose a lot of weight. I was told many times that I could have a, a, a role if I did certain things. I was told where to live, who to be with, what to say in interviews, and I didn't like that at all. That made me profoundly uncomfortable. And even though I'd grown up with a mother who was a feminist, not a bad word, <laughs> I still, I still experienced these things, and I felt very helpless to do something against them. So I moved to Egypt. Who would have thought that that would have been an emancipatory experience? But it was. I felt oddly freer here than I did in Los Angeles. Back to the idea of intersectionality, right? So I experience women's rights and, um, and, and issues around not having rights in Egypt differently than I do in the US because I'm American and I look a little different and there are certain things that I'm that 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 I'm protected by because of those I'm very very aware of that the experiences that I have as a woman in Egypt very different than the girl that I saw on the street who yesterday was you know wouldn't leave me alone and was begging for for money we're not the same at all so it's really important to take that into consideration when I had a daughter, for the first time, this is my extended family, all the powerful women in my life, and my daughter younger and my daughter more recently, you know, it, it really struck me that she was inheriting a world that, that wasn't fair, and that as a woman that she was maybe not going to have certain accesses and also not see herself as, as powerful as male counterparts, and so like we have equality and then we have power um, intertwined, but very different things. When she was a baby and I would read her stories, I noticed, and this was 2002, so things have changed, but I noticed that 95% of the main characters in children's books were, were men. They just, they just are. I mean, they've changed a lot. And so I just changed the names. And I would read to her for years. And I would say she instead of he. Only 50-50. I just was after 50-50. But, but I was amazed at how many books that I had to do that with. When she got a little bit older, I remember a day that she was playing in preschool in, um, in like a little puddle. It had rained. And all the boys were in their boots stomping and throwing mud. And, and she jumped in there. And the boys in 2006 said, you can't do this. And she said, why? And it was a group of very, very progressive parents who care about you know, gender equality. And we all went. And I thought, is this my moment to intercede? And I thought, no, I'm going to let her. And do you know what she said? She said, I'm a boy. And they all said, yay! And then for about two years, she was a boy because she needed to have that understanding of power. I kind of watched the whole time, and I had several friends who were, maybe she is a boy. Today, I might have done something, you know, thinking it were more than it was, but it, it wasn't. She saw some power that some men had, and she wanted, boys had, and she wanted it. And that was her three-year-old response. So I just wanted to kind of contextualize. Um, what time is it? Do I need to hurry along? Ten more minutes. Okay, I'll go five. So how far have we come? Not enough. That's exactly what the video said, and that's what Dr. Hoda said. I thought that the definition of feminism is really important. It's the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of the equality of the sexes. All it is is equality, not more, just the same. Pew Research Center is a really wonderful organization in the US, and in a 2020 survey, they cited the majority, men and women, both believe that gender equality still has not come far enough. But women were more inclined to feel this way. Three in 10 men said that women's gains have come at the expense of men, which I think is really interesting. So how is that? Is, I don't think about that. When, when someone gets power, does that take power away from you? Um, and men are more likely to believe in the U.S. that women's rights will be achieved fully, full equality, in their lifetime. Yeah. 
So we saw the highlight of major obstacles, right? We know women got the right to vote in 2020. Wyoming was the first state where women got the right to vote. That was in 1869. That's pretty interesting. We don't think of that as a particularly like strong, progressive, forward-thinking state. But they also, I think, were the first state that had, um, I'm not sure, was it, but it was another really big um, gain. 77% of people who said that women still didn't have equality ranked sexual harassment as the number one obstacle to women gaining that. So, you know, I go back to my LA years where I was told, you know, oh, you'll be great, but you need to lose weight. Oh, you'll be great, but come on, you need to do this. Th that's harassment, that's abuse, and, and I left. I didn't stay and say, no, this is something I want. I, I moved away. I left the country because I didn't feel that I could do that, which is really sad. Um, can I go back? Yeah, because I think it just moved forward. There we go. So just the other things, you know, 60% of people say that women not have it, women still don't have the same legal rights. And we go to the, you know, Roe v. Wade. That was 1973 that women were given the right to control their bodies if they were pregnant to terminate a pregnancy. And then it was taken away. And I think regardless of what you think about whether that's a, the right thing to do, it, it affects it affects the very autonomy of a woman to be able to do what she thinks is right. And so it's taking away her agency and saying, what you feel is right for you is not right. And, and so that's, if you can think about it, if you can parcel out the pro-life or the, um, the, the abortion rights and think about it just in terms of an individual woman being able to control her body. 66% of people who don't think there are enough rights, say that societal expectations of men and women are different. 64% say women don't have enough power. And then, of course, women are more likely to see all of this as a major obstacle. I want to point out that having women be parents is not on there. It's kind of something that you might think, like, oh, that, that's an impediment to women having rights. It's not really in any of the major literature that comes up. So, I know we're short on time, and there might be a qu couple questions, so I don't need to do the last one. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Jillian and Dr. Huda, for your presentations today. Okay, um, Q and A's. Any questions you'd like to ask any of our panelists? Any questions? I know they have to leave for class in like five or ten minutes. So. Um, okay. Yes. Thank you very much for, for the presentation. I have a question for Dr. Hoda. Um, for the, the, the current situation that you mentioned where women in Egypt have rights in the public sphere and not in the private sphere, how, do you see that changing in the near future? Are there actions being taken? How are, are there negotiations underway? How, how does that look in the, the next few years as changing or, or continuing that way? Yes, right. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, all I can say is that, yes, it has to change, so it will change. And um, when exactly is another, uh, I mean, it's another issue. But I, what I will say is that actually advocacy to change personal status laws has been, has been really the trademark of Egyptian feminists uh, in Egypt, yeah, of Egyptian feminists. So it's an ongoing uh, struggle, I think. Thank you for your question. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, Ma has the mic. So I was kind of thinking about the a question along the same lines. Um, changing a culture and changing structures are two different things. Changing the law is a different thing than changing a culture. Um, any, I, I mean, I know this is kind of completely conjecture, but I, I, would, I would imagine, I mean, maybe it's not for you, but um, what, what are the expectations on, from 
the time that we change the law, again, going back to the kind of the public and, and, and family or domestic distinction that you were talking about, Dr. Hoda, um, what, what should the expectation be between changing the law to changing the culture? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very important question. But, you know, thinking of the, all the revolutionary changes that have happened, so, I mean, I mean if you think of the anti-slavery act in the US, I mean, it, 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 um, if you study what was happening, I mean, half the people were against it, really. I mean, it's not like it was a unanimous thing in the US. So just so, to me, I think laws can be the, um, in Arabic, uh, okay, so it's like the, um, the train that kind of push forward a society, right? And that's, so that's one thing. And, um, and I always think when I look at, when you look at the details, when you look at the really, the, the, the details of what actually happened, you, it, I've, I've always come to the conclusion it's politics and it's not culture. Cultures do change. It is not true that cultures don't change and can change so fast, much quicker than we all imagine. And I think this argument that, you know, this is culture is, has been used to curtail and to undermine uh, changes in women's, you know, in the, in the status of women. So, so yeah, so cultures can change and politics, it's politics, not culture, I think. And I would just add that sometimes the, the policies and the politics are much slower. Like I think of the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, which I think was first proposed in 1923 in the US. It still hasn't passed. So this is something that is so slow. Sometimes when politics or governments are really slow, people get very frustrated and they enact more. In fact, I would even say that when things are sometimes going smoothly, people rest and they don't fight as hard as they should. And sometimes when we have these moments where we are really, things are taken away from us, we have to push even harder. We're, we have a renewed interest in the cause and I'm not advocating for having, you know, taking steps back, but sometimes that does help, help us move forward. I've, I'm just thinking of again when Roe v. Wade was overturned in the US and you know, it's, it's caused a resurgence, I think, in the younger generation and in my generation and the older generation feeling that they, even if they're not supported with policy in their own personal and independent moments in their lives, they are standing up more and fighting for small victories and it's those small victories that make the big ones. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? question? All right, go ahead, Emma. Um, I really liked what you said about how women in the public sphere versus women in the domestic sphere, which where do they have rights? And I, I was wondering what you think your hypothesis of what that would look like in the future. Because we see laws in Egypt being very friendly towards women, but we don't see the private life being that friendly. So what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, well, the thing is, I really think, again, politics, not culture. I mean, okay, I just mentioned that, um, you know, um, okay, I'll just share with you that there was this campaign that was um, launched two years ago, Guardianship is My Right, right? And I think the participation, the level of participation of like ordinary individuals in this campaign at least told me that there is, I mean, I'll call it popular support for changing the laws which is something that yeah, I, I always hope that the policy makers, decision makers take into consideration. So <clears throat> eventually it has to change because it's against reason and it's against, I don't know what to say, logic and it's against the actual lives of women, right? So you have all these, you know, very, very weird, uh, you know, discrepancies between what you actually do and then what the law says. And then of course women find out about this horrible gap when there's a problem, unfortunately. A lot of women just live their lives, you know, without perhaps seeing that there is a problem, but, but there is a problem. So it has to change, it has to change. Um, first of all, I want to say um, I come from Syria and I'm new in Egypt, and I'm just amazed about some of the things you said about politics because I would never dream of listening to something like this in the university in, in Syria, like 
neither a man nor a woman can, can talk about politics. Um, my question is, how much of a catalyst do you think uh, social media uh, is? Because I follow uh, many um, feminist pages in Arabic and I get uh, local news from the social media about things that are happening in Egypt or in Jordan or during the war in Syria to women specifically. They are more affected and, um, and so um, how much do you think, because when you talked about the, uh, the 70s and the UN uh, decade and the conferences, I think that was like for certain women who went to the conferences, but not all the women were aware of what was happening. So your comment on that. Yeah, I mean, well, social media is again another double-edged sword, right? So definitely at a certain point in time, it has been, you know, a tool for mobilization. Absolutely, it was, it's been a space for mobilization for people coming together, and it remains so. I mean, we do have, I mean, there are connections now, you know, between everybody in unprecedented ways. But then, of course, we have to look at the, you know, the other side of the coin of social media. It can, I mean, it has been, again, mobilized by, let's call them, you know, regressive forces to counter, you know, social movements. So, yeah, so like everything in the world, you know, can be abused, but still important. I, I totally agree. Um, yeah, so I don't know, I mean, I think we just have to, we just have to be very vigilant, we have to all be very tech savvy, I'm telling myself that is something we have to all learn, and to be able to, you know, deal with this new animal that is forced on, on all of us, right? So, yeah. It's a tool for education, yeah. and sometimes it mis miseducates us, so I see that uh, women's groups all over are stronger because it's a way to pull them together, but also the backlash of, you know, the Andrew Tates of the world that are, that are now given a voice and given a platform. So it, it, it's interesting to just think about it as a form of education. And again, if we go back to, you know, like how many women are in universities right now, that's a massive leap forward. We will see some big leaps in equality. Can we do the same thing with social media, though? Can we make it more educational? Um, it, I think it's up to every single one of us. And then teaching the people in our spheres and in our families and in our communities that that's the way it should be used as well. There's no way we can, I can't reach that many people. It's, a, it's something that's far more interesting. It has way more information than I have as an educator. So I can't kind of pit myself against it. I have to work with it. So let's figure out how it can be a tool to educate not just the people who already believe in equality, but the people who don't. That's very true. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, we know how. I know we all need to wrap it up, but I cannot uh, let this opportunity pass with having Gillian on the podium and ask about the role of arts, the liberating role of, of the arts. And I, I want to pick up on your, your, your journey from being an actress to where you're, you're, you are now and say, I'll throw this as a provocative hypothesis to both of you, right? Hollywood has objectified women from day one. Egyptian film industry has actually helped liberate women from day one. Your reaction to that? No. You. Well, I mean, I think the arts is... Many, many things can be a catalyst to change a person's mind or to let, let them experience the other. But the arts is incredibly powerful in this realm, and so is performance, both theater and video. Um, audiences can understand their lives through the characters that they're either portraying or watch portrayed, and they can make decisions about how they want to work in the world based on that, in a very free of consequence kind of way. So it can also model behaviors if you're, if you're thinking about um, you know, trying out a new behavior, you can try that in the role of a character. 
um, and then learn from it. So I think it's, we do, that, we do that even when we go to see a movie. We identify with the protagonist in the film and um, if the protagonist ends up you know, struggling in some way, we feel that pain very, very deeply. So I think particularly performing arts is a really wonderful way, but, but visual arts as well. I had up here some that we didn't get to, but I had this wonderful kind of example of some of the beautiful artwork in Egypt recently that has come about since 2011, including you know, this really great piece by, by Dr. Bahia Shaheb, who's one of our professors that you know, is talking about women's rights. Um, so it's, it's, it's really profound. But your second question was, yeah, how Hollywood objectifies women. Absolutely, it's it still does, and I I think that e that Egypt can has brought about um, some emancipation, but at the same time, women are not really encouraged to participate as makers of performing arts here. I've had students who've even not even been able to take a second class with me, and who have said, I really want to take a second drama class, but I can't. My family doesn't let me because it's not seen as something that's, because it's a little dangerous, it's a little murky, it's, it's, it's controversial in a way. So I don't know what the answer there is, but I know that not doing it is not the answer. Yeah, I mean, okay, so commercial cinema has propagated a very specific story about the liberation of women. Um, which is, okay, you, you can be, you, you have to have access to education, to employment, but, I mean, if you, if you think of a lot of these really interesting, Ustaza Fatma and all of these films, at the end of the day, you have to go back and consult with a man, or you have to prove that you're a mother, a good mother, you know, you, you can work, but you have to be a good mother, otherwise you're not an honorable woman, so there's a very specific story. And of course, I, I happened to see this presentation, I can't remember where, where it has um, normalized the idea, the fact that men can slap women all the time. So this is a problem, right? So men slap women in films all the time. And we've had uh, some of the actresses actually who are like, let's call them feminist actresses who refuse to be slapped. So, I mean, okay, so he can push them, he can, but you know, to be slapped all the time, you're normalizing violence against women in a way that, so, on the, so there is a certain liberatory narrative there, but a very uh, limited one. We want more, yeah. And of course, there are films that challenge that, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for a oh, question. All right, sure, okay. Uh, For Professor Campana, um, so obviously the feminist movement has usually been tied with progressive and liberal movements. So now uh, my question is regarding people like Marine Le Pen in France, or the Italian Prime Minister now, I believe is the first female Prime Minister of Italy, but are leading very right-wing movements. How does that tie into the whole narrative? I, very strongly. I mean, you know, the the when when uh, Amy. Um, Comey, Comey Barnett was appointed Supreme Court Justice. That's when the Supreme Court overturned Roe Ro versus Wade. So, I mean, she's very extreme, and I mean, uh, the U.S. government is also facing this. The Netherlands is also facing this. It's it's all over. When I shared with you those statistics earlier. Um, about you know what how far w different people think women have come. It's also broken down. The Pew Center breaks it down according to um, uh, political affiliations, and conservative voters in the U.S. are far less likely to believe that um, women don't have. They, they believe that women have equal rights in all of those those areas. Sexual harassment is not as much of a problem. Women have rights. Um, men's rights are being taken away. So it is a massive, massive threat. I mean, when, you know, when Trump was elected and Hillary Clinton was not, and again, you can think politically what you want about them, 
I wonder if she were a man, if she would have been elected with exactly the same background, exactly the same. And I think most women, even if they don't say it, felt something amiss there. It's a large claim. I understand it's a very large claim to make, but um, it struck me as being very obvious and something that people are very afraid to talk about as well. Uh, any more questions? All right. I'd like to thank our, both our speakers. Thank you very much for being with us today. It's, it's such a pleasure and honor. This was very interesting and enlightening. Thank you so much. Please join me in uh, thanking our uh, speakers. Thank you.